Hello listeners, welcome to See How We Run, conversations with arts and cultural workers. This is a special Below the Radar series hosted by Julia Aoki, Kathy Fang, and Samantha Walters. See How We Run is a mini-series looking at local arts collectives and organizations, highlighting conversations about creation, space-making, accessibility, and self-determination within the framework of Vancouver cityscape. These episodes are recorded on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Hello, welcome to the first episode of See How We Run, Conversations with Arts and Cultural Workers. My name is Julia Aoki, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Kathy Fang and Samantha Walters. Hi. Hello. So our voices may be familiar to our audience because we've been around the podcast, we've worked on the podcast, but I thought that we could start by introducing ourselves, who we are in the office, and, and what our practices are outside of the office. And I can start. So my name is Julia Aoki. I am a program manager at the Van City Office of Community Engagement. I've been with the office for a few months now, and over half a year. Prior to that, I was with Megaphone Magazine as the executive director, and I've uh, worked with a number of artist-run centers in the past as well. I was with Vivo Media Art Center. I've been on the board of 221A Artist Run Center and Or Gallery Access. And prior to that, I was the general manager of the Powell Street Festival a number of years ago. Hi, my name is Kathy, and I am a research assistant at the Van City Office of Community Engagement. I have been working with the office for Coming up to four years at this point, I started right before the pandemic when I was still in school. I majored in visual arts at the School for the Contemporary Arts at SFU. And outside of my work at the office, I am also an emerging interdisciplinary artist. And my artistic practice is very much informed by being an immigrant. I was born in Guangzhou, China, and immigrated to Vancouver when I was four. So really thinking through space relations and also interpersonal and community relations through that lens. Hi, I'm Sam. I am the program assistant here at SFU's Fan City Office of Community Engagement. And I'm also a recent graduate of the School for the Contemporary Arts, except I studied theater performance. I'm also currently an interdisciplinary artist in the city, emerging as well really interested in how theater companies and performance companies organize themselves and my arts practice is also concerned with space and power relations as well. So for a series we have all done our individual interviews and I wanted to start off by having us all introduce our guests and also talk about some of the questions and ideas around arts and cultural production that informed our conversations. So um, I've been thinking about artist-run centers and artist-run culture for some time. Uh, During my time as a graduate student at SFU, I was very interested in the history of artist-run centers, uh, and particularly around this kind of central tension that they negotiate, which I think applies to other cultural spaces as well. Artist-run centers, in my experience, are sites for imagining alterity, for difference, for exercising collective forms of organization. And, you know, historically, they were sort of, they emerged as spaces of distinction from public museums and uh, private galleries. And, you know, discursively, also, they've there's language around them being kind of radical spaces, uh, spaces of radical otherness. But what is interesting to me is that they're also these sort of coherent institutional forms that have been recognized and legitimized through their state relations, through funding relationships, through reporting requirements to funders and uh, to the government if they're charities or nonprofit associations, and through the organizational structure. So there's this kind of inherent tension for, this is true of, of other organizations, I'm sure, but cultural organizations that are trying to realize something different, trying to, uh, you know, do decolonial work, trying to work in a non-hierarchical way, in an accessible way. And so in different times of my life, I've been very interested in this tension. And for this series in particular, I decided to explore that through two interviews. 
uh, one with Demi London and Maroti George of Gallery Gachet, and one with Kate Hurley and Sarah Common from Hives for Humanity. So Gallery Gachet is a gallery that's located in the downtown east side. They have a long history of doing work that is centered around uh, accessibility to the community here. Uh, and that's partly through kind of um, their regular exhibition programming, but sort of accessible drop-in programming as well. Yeah, so they've been grappling for a long time with, you know, what is the appropriate way of creating space for peer representation and self-determination and how do you do that in a way that is supportive? The other conversation is with Hives for Humanity, uh, which is a little bit outside of the framework of the conversation because it is an apicultural organization. They they have apiaries that they run throughout the city and they have programs that involve peers, again, largely from the downtown east side, sort of on a social enterprise model. But again, they've been kind of working against the imposed infrastructure of nonprofits and charities, trying to find ways to, again, sort of make their work more porous with the community, create more space for self-determination. And how do you do that again in a meaningful way that isn't just sort of uh, a matter of tokenizing individuals, but, you know, providing adequate support for whatever way you're offering the community to engage. And so I've find them both really interesting organizations for exploring that kind of central tension. And I'm really excited for people to hear it. Yeah, so I spoke to Caitlin Jones and Alan Dominguez about the Backstage Spaces report from Progress Lab 1422. And so Progress Lab 1422 is a theater interdisciplinary arts space in the east side of Vancouver, sort of between Clark and Commercial. It's on William Street 1422, which is where the number in the name comes from. But essentially, there are about eight companies who work out of there full time, or eight or nine, maybe even. But just to shout them all out quickly, it's Company 605, Electric Company Theater, The Frank Theater, New World, Play Arts Theater Center, Rice and Beans, Rumble, Tara Cheyenne Performance, Theater Conspiracy. Like if you're in performance in the city, you you know or have worked with multiple of these organizations. It's a really important space for theater creation, interdisciplinary arts creation, mostly performance in the city. And Alan is the managing director at New World Theater, which is one of the resident companies there. Caitlin is a longtime arts consultant, curator, producer. She's worked at many different places. Um, and she was helping C Space, which is the board that runs Progress Lab, write this report called Backstage Spaces, essentially highlighting the needs of a space like Progress Lab when it comes to essentially affording and running its space. We get into a lot of tax and talk and these sort of regulatory things. And Julia is also there in the conversation, helping out with her uh, past experience with these kind of organizations and running space. And yeah, I think it's it's the report came out earlier this year and I just think it was really important to highlight because it's so foundational to like how we produce art in this city, given the affordability crisis, given the space crisis. And yeah, Alan and Caitlin had have this report, very well-defined recommendations of how we can go about creating and maintaining art space and how organizations and companies can continue to do what they're doing having a city that essentially has art and performance still. But yeah, I also have a very personal connection to the space. I feel like I am, Kathy and I actually both, at separate times, we were both interns for Playwrights Theatre Centre and then I continued to work there for a while. Rumble Theatre produced my first ever professional production in, a, in their Tremors Festival there, which was at Progress Lab. So I got to sort of use the space for a while and perform there. And they're just, it, if this space is just so important. Yeah. And for me, I was really thinking about just from my personal experience of being a recent graduate of art school and also an emerging artist and uh, spaces that are accessible to emerging artists and spaces that aren't. And also just the value of community building for emerging artists and ways that we can support each other. So I brought on two guests and one of them is Asia Zhang, who is a curator, arts facilitator, and cultural worker. And she was a part of Ground Floor Art Center. And Ground Floor Art Center is 
an artist-run collective whose mandate is to platform and give spaces to early emerging artists. And for a while, they had a space on Gore Street uh, right until the pandemic. And they've also done partnerships with uh, the Contemporary Art Gallery to create the Wedge Residency, which was a residency program that allowed for early emerging artists to be mentored and also work within a larger institution. And I also talked to Vittoria Montero, who is an interdisciplinary artist and cultural worker. They work as the acting curator of learning and engagement at the Contemporary Art Gallery. And they're also on the board of Grunt Gallery. And we actually went to school together. We were in the same cohort in uh, visual art and we graduated together. So that was really, really great to see all the really cool stuff that they're working on. So their practice has a lot to do with the archive or anti-archive as they call it. And also looking at accessibility within uh, traditional institutional spaces. So I really wanted to bring these two incredible people in conversation together to talk about these ideas of making spaces for emerging artists and the value of that and the work and care that goes into that and how important it is for emerging artists. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited for people to hear that conversation, but also for that conversation to be a starting point for other people to build off of, because I think that is, you know, the ethos of it. Uh, yeah. So so why is it called See How We Run? We also think it's really important that you know there's an exclamation point. <laughs> and also every title. time I say See How We Run, I am also doing the motion of a running stick figure. And I think that is also important. Just hold that in your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Visual imagery. Well, throughout all of our conversations, we there is an underlining thread about organizational structure and like how spaces run to to be very blunt i i'm also thinking about when we have the title when we hear this title see how we run you know that show from the 2000s or whatever how it's made, oh, how it's made. Oh, yeah. i i just i think of that and it's like i into this the modes of production but i don't know where i'm going with this it's sort of it's like it's demystifying yeah. something yeah for ourselves and hopefully for people who are listening to yeah. this to to think because i mean it seems very obvious what an organization is what it's offering um and possibly even how it operates but anytime you start to investigate an organization you start to see the complex relationships behind it and that's very interesting to me because in a lot of ways that's where you know, your loftier, bigger ideals, your uh, ethics, your kind of vision for an organization or a community is realized and is confronted with all kinds of practical challenges. And, you know, especially in a climate where operating a space is incredibly financially onerous, you know, there's a lot of barriers to acquiring space and operating space. I think it could be really useful to take a closer look and, and you know, start to offer some insight into how to do that in Vancouver. Yeah. Yeah. I really like the term demystifying for that, because I also I think with arts and cultural production, if you're not in that industry, it's not necessarily something that you would think about, I guess. Just our day to day art processes are very complicated <laughs> sometimes and are made overly complicated by having to deal with various levels of government and having to be able to afford production. and yeah, Especially for like DIY spaces, which uh, I spoke about with Asia. It's so, so difficult. And, and that was also a part of other conversations with uh, Demi as well. It's that's one of the most difficult things just to get the funding, but also to have the energy and like put in or the capacity to put in all the work because there's a lot of work that goes behind it that is uh, not often seen. Mm -hmm. I also find it really interesting. I think there's, um, a you know, often very valid, vigorous critiques of institutions that are incredibly important. And I don't want to be an institutional apologist, but I do know from being inside them that, you know, all organizations are going to be some kind of combination of 
progressive, regressive, maintaining the status quo. And, you know, it can be more of one or the other. By looking at the elements that kind of make it such, you you have more opportunity to kind of pull towards something more in line with your ideals. This is something actually I thought a lot about as when I kind of cut my teeth at the Powell Street Festival, a Japanese Canadian cultural festival that operates in what, you know, was considered the former Japantown as very much in the heart of the what is known today as the downtown east side. And as I start to look more and more in that history, it gave me a sense of, again, the sort of complex relationships, but how much of that, the people that are involved in that history offer something, every single thread that you pull at within that organization offers an insight into a very complex history, be it, you know, the longer history of Japanese Canadian internment, of course, but also, you know, in the 70s movements, progressive movements towards redress, but also how that dovetailed with wider, wider civil rights movements, that there were actually individuals or one individual in particular who was involved with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the southern states who came back and was sort of bringing some of those ideals back to the institution. You know, just sort of thinking about, yeah, all of those like very complex, uh, all of the complex relationships that make up an institution, I think is is quite fascinating. Yeah. And the sort of line that arts and culture organizations are often out of progressive movements and moments and then you have to reckon with becoming an institution and becoming sort of this historicized thing as well. And you have to have a board even. And then there, there's a certain conservatism to that. And then we get into funding. And like I, I think a lot of arts leaders talk about this kind of contradiction we find ourselves in where it's our, our values are in one place, but we're getting a lot of funding from organizations that maybe don't represent those values. And how do we work with that how do we collaborate through that like you're not going to reject twenty thousand dollars because you need that money to work even if you're sort of trying to platform decolonial ideas that are inherently sort of anti-institutional yeah and i think all of our conversations are very i mean they're all people that work in vancouver but they're all super vancouver based conversations as well yeah yeah and i feel like all of our conversations are very much grounded within the community of arts and cultural workers as well and just to hear that i think from different aspects and different spaces within the community i think is so special to bring those conversations together into this mini series because it also reflects each of our positionings from within the office but also within our own communities and our own uh, practices so yeah Below the Radar is a knowledge democracy podcast created by SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement. Thanks for listening to our introductory episode with SFU Voce staff, Julia Aoki, Kathy Fang, and Samantha Walters. Tune in next week for the second episode of our See How We Run miniseries, where we'll be talking with New World Theatre's Managing Director, Alan Dominguez, and consultant Caitlin Jones about Progress Lab 1422's Backstage Spaces report which provides an understanding of the issues performance creation spaces face in terms of affordability, city zoning, and property tax. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on your podcast listening app of choice, and we'll catch you next time on Below the Radar. See how we run. See see how we run. See how we run. See how we run. See how we run. Hello, listeners. Welcome to See How We Run. Come, see how we run. 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 Okay. <laughs> okay. Hello, listeners. Welcome to See How We Run. Conversations with arts and cultural workers. This is a. <laughs> I, I did it. I know because I did it. I did it, and then I was like, I, did, I went down. I didn't go up. Um,